Freeman, you've talked about numerical accidents in the laws of physics that lead to a universe that's unexpectedly habitable. What does that mean? Well, the fact is, it wasn't my idea. I think Brandon Carter was one of the first who talked about this. The fact is that there are a, a, a number of fine tunings that seem to be necessary to make a universe habitable the way ours is. That, for example, the water molecule has very special properties. The fact that ice is lighter than water, so it floats <laughs> instead of sinking when it freezes. That's absolutely essential to life in the oceans. If the, if the oceans f froze from the bottom up, there would be no chance for fish ever to have been invented. And, and so the, 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 there are similar problems with nuclear physics. There's a famous example of a, a certain energy level in carbon that is a, a, a state of the nucleus of the carbon atom, which Fred Hoyle predicted had to exist in order to produce the carbon in stars, although it had never been seen. And it turns out it does exist, as it was verified afterwards. But without that particular level having to be in that particular <laughs> place, carbon couldn't have been produced in stars and there couldn't be life. So there is a, a number of details of that sort which seem to have been sort of fine-tuned to, 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 to make it possible for creatures like us to evolve and begin asking the questions. And uh, so this has always been a, a, a little bit of a mystery, and it's becoming more so as we understand more about the, the structure of nuclei and particle physics and so forth. And, and the, one of the big mysteries is why the universe expands so slowly. And, and there is a very... A, a, a thing called the, 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 the cosmical constant, which could have any value it likes. <laughs> it happens to have a particular very, very small value, which allows the, the universe to expand slowly. If the value of cosmical constant were a bit larger, the thing would have expanded out of sight long, long ago before <laughs> there could be even atoms. And, and so it goes on. There are, there are many of these... Uh, what appear to be accidents that make the, the, the universe friendly. What follows from that? Well, that's the question. And then, <laughs> so there are roughly speaking two possibilities that you say either there's a whole multitude of universes and that uh, creatures like us, of course, then only ap appear on those that are favorable for the, for the growth of life. And so then it is not an accident that we happen to be here so there's a huge choice of universes, and life evolved just on the one that happened to have the right characteristics. So that's one possible explanation, which I find is, is all right as far as it goes. Unfortunately, I mean, all the other universes are purely hypothetical. <laughs> we never shall have a chance to verify whether they exist or not. So in a way, it puts the, the, the question outside the reach of science, which is, which is sort of a shame. As on the, the, the other possibility is that there's only one universe, and this remains as a mystery, which we don't understand, and that brings it back into the realm of sciences, and it's a problem we still have to understand. And that's the way I prefer it. I'd rather have an unsolved problem than, than, than an unscientific <laughs> explanation. Well, let's assume that it is only one universe, and we're all convinced of that. How then possibly could you get this fine-tuning? Some would suggest that indicates some sort of... Uh, a plan, a teleology, an end, an end seeking, whether it's a, some sort of a mind or God in one hand, or even a, a universe that's somehow self-conscious and self-creating. I mean, there are a lot of theories out there. Yes, and those, of course, are not, not yet scientific theories, but they, 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 they are speculations, and they're, they're, I, I don't find anything wrong with that. Just don't call them science. Mm. And, and no, I do a bit of that myself. And it, it's, I, I think that there is probably a mental component of the universe, and you can call it God if you like. And, and, but uh, if that is so, then there's no reason why that, that this mental component shouldn't have had a hand in setting the conditions. You've talked about this problem in terms of, uh, of where we go, what follows, 
as something that should be expelled from science, uh, uh, why do you want to expel it, and, and where is it expelled into? Yeah, well, I, 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 so the word expel is perhaps too strong, but I, <laughs> I would, I, I like to, to, to take a strict, so in the legal sense, a strict constructionist okay. view of science. Science is just one particular set of tools. It happens to be very good f for finding laws of nature, and in, 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 it, it, it has been sort of unexpectedly powerful, but it is still only a set of tools. And there are many other ways of acquiring knowledge. We can acquire knowledge from literature, we can acquire knowledge from history, we can acquire knowledge from religion and from many other, from many other sources. Science is only one of many. And so it is, it's quite reasonable to have other kinds of speculation going on which haven't any particular scientific basis just don't get it mixed up with science. <laughs> now, uh, other people would like to expel it from science and, and, and cast it into Hades. Yes, <laughs> that I wouldn't want to do. And, and so I think that's why I don't like the word expel. <laughs> but it should be, it, I think it's a good idea to, 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 to have, to have a, a, some sort of separation. And, and I mean, literature in particular is, 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 is something that is much older than science and much more widely understood, much more accessible to most people. Mm. One shouldn't underrate that. I mean, it, it, is, it, is, mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is certainly a valid source of knowledge, but it, is, it depends on imagination, it depends on experience, it, 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 it depends on our relations with each other as a society. And all these things, of course, are not supposed to be part of science. You've talked about the term meta science <clears throat> how, how is that how does that differ from science and what does it include well meta science essentially is just talking about science as a social phenomenon and so it is it's part of uh, you might say it's part of history or part of philosophy so considering science in, in, in the framework of, of, of human activities in general in the framework of philosophies and religions. Would any of these different ways of knowing, as opposed to science or as complementary to science, help us with the fine-tuning problem? Well, I can't say how what will what will happen in the future. I don't see why they shouldn't. It's I mean clearly some, some people would say why they shouldn't. Some yes. people would say that any of these other traditions, literature, philosophy, certainly religion, should have absolutely nothing to do with the fine-tuning problem. Yes, well, they, they can say that, but it still probably is, is, is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we just don't know. But I think to exclude such a possibility is absurd. But why do they want to exclude it? What, what is the, I, I mean, you've had such a, a, a deep understanding, and you, you say that's absurd to exclude these other ways of knowing, but many feel that to include these ways of knowing in addressing problems like this would muddy the waters, would lead to uh, 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 confused thinking, would distort uh, uh, people's minds, allow uh, a superstition to come in, all sorts of problems. Yeah, well, that, 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 that's all true, of course, and up to a point. But I would say they're suffering from what, what I would call sort of scientific fundamentalism. When they, so to, uh, pretending that science can explain everything or that science should explain everything, which is sort of, it's, it's, I, I, it's a sort of in, uh, scientific imperialism, uh, uh, believing that science sh should be the only source of truth. <laughs> which I think is rubbish. And it's just about a, a sort of a mirror image of, of what the f religious fundamentalists do who claim that the Bible should explain everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's, they're just as... It's, biologists seem to be worse at this than physicists on the whole. Biologists tend to be more arrogant in their beliefs than, than physicists. <laughs> and, and it is a kind of arrogance which is I find very similar to the arrogance of the religious fundamentalists. Well, when you bring them both together to, to look at this issue, because the fine-tuning of the universe is a subject that uh, 
biological fundamentalists, to use your term, religious fundamentalists, physicists, all philosophers, all are looking at with uh, with a great deal of currency lately. Oh yes, and they're fighting like cats, which I think <laughs> doesn't particularly help. But the first thing is to respect each other and, and to respect each other's point of view. You know, I like them fighting, and I don't know why I like them. I like to see them fighting because it 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 it, it, it is not just entertaining, which I, I do find it entertaining. But for forgetting that, I I think it 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 it, it rubs iron against iron or flint against flint, and you you see sparks. And, and I think it, it reflects the importance of this question. I think this is an enormously important question. And if people were just making nice about it, it would, it would take away some of the energy. Well, if you enjoy <laughs> that kind of thing, then I wouldn't want to deprive you of it. But no, it, I think it does, it, it does terrible harm if you bring up children particularly. Because I mean, so, all these fights are really about education. And, and the question, how do you bring up children? If you bring up children to believe that they have to, either to be atheists or be oh. believers, and that if they're believers, they can't be scientists, and if they're scientists, they have to be atheists, that, I think, is doing great harm. It is it, it, giving the it, children the idea they have to choose between either fundamentalist religion on one side or fundamentalist <laughs> atheism on the other side. And that is doing great harm because it, put, it it actually turns off a lot of children who might have been scientists. They believe they can't be scientists without being atheists. At the end of the day, at the end of the millennium, whenever, uh, it comes down to what is truth. It doesn't come down to what makes me feel good or you feel good. It's it's what is really true. Uh, how, how do how do you? How do you look at that? How, what, what do you think is really true about the fine-tuning of the universe? Oh, I certainly don't know. I mean, that is, again, I'm very happy to to, 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 to be ignorant. And I think, that, to me, that's the true mark of a, of a scientist, that you, you are completely happy with not knowing the answer yet. Because if, you, if you knew the answers to everything, then science would would be dead. It, it is that, that that would be the end of science. So science consists in not knowing the answers, and still being skeptical, still doubting everything you hear. Mm. 